Born in Tehran and now based in Los Angeles, Dr. Nina Ansari is a historian, human rights advocate, and leading expert on the women's movement in Iran. Her book, Jewels of Allah, The Untold Story of Women in Iran, is inspired by her scholarly journey at Columbia University. It shatters the stereotypical assumptions in the often misunderstood story of women in Iran today. Nina was recently honored as one of the 21 leaders of the 21st century by Women's E! News, and she serves on the Middle East Institute Advisory Board at Columbia University and on Columbia University's Global Leadership Council. For more information, visit her website, ninaanzari.com. Also tonight, Stephen Gutzler is the president of Leadership Quest, a Seattle-based leadership development company. He has delivered over 2,500 presenta presentations to a who's who's list of clients, <coughs> including Pandora Radio, Microsoft, Starbucks, Boeing, Cisco, Star Wars Corporation, U.S. Security Administration, and Oxford Financial, to name just a few. For more information, visit his website at stevegutzler.com. Yasmin Baito Ali, I hope I said that correctly, is a contributor for the Huffington Post. She runs a marketing firm and has advised members of the Fortune 500, including AT&T and PayPal. She has also advised numerous nonprofits, including TED Global and Habitat for Humanity. Please join me in welcoming our speakers. What if I told you that I was the only firefighter in my hometown? What if I told you I was the first to compete for my country in the Winter Olympics? What if I told you I was the lead singer of an acclaimed rock and roll band? And a computational geneticist has been deemed one of the top 100 geniuses of our time. What if I told you my photographs have been published in National Geographic, The New York Times, Newsweek, and Time Magazine? What if I told you that I won my nation's first ever motocross. What if I told you I won a gold medal in the Paralympic Games? What if I told you I was the first from my country to scale an 8,000 meter peak in the Himalayas? What if I told you I became the first suffrage martyr in my country after appearing unveiled in public? They strangled me with a silk scarf, threw me into a garden well, and filled it with stones and soil. If I told you that, would you believe that I'm a woman from Iran? If I told you that, would you believe I was a woman from Iran? If I told you that, would you believe that I'm a woman from Iran? I am a woman from Iran. I'm a woman from Iran. I'm a woman from Iran. I am a woman from Iran. I'm a woman from Iran. I'm often quoted as having said, you can kill me as soon as you like, but you cannot stop the emancipation of women. this evening, um, and thank you for the kind introduction. Um, we just saw a lovely trailer, very powerful, very powerful message, and I think to what we can do now is really segue into what would you attempt to accomplish if you knew that you could not fail. We're um, here speaking about inspirational leadership in a culture of fear. That right there, those words right there may resonate with many of you in this room. It does certainly resonate uh, with me. And um, we'd like to talk more about that this evening. So Nina, Nina John, what would you do if you, if you knew that you could not fail? Exactly what I'm doing now. Very good. <laughs> but um, I'm happy that this discussion is uh, being brought to the forefront this evening because we do uh, live in a way that we're fearful of what we don't know. And that leads to a lot of misconceptions, misperceptions, stereotypical assumptions. So uh, I was guilty of that for many years myself. Uh, I have often 
told people, and I like to quote Alice Walker, who was a foremost feminist. She said, the most common way people give up their power is by thinking that they don't have any. And uh, what I'd like to uh, talk about this evening with Steve and Yasmin and everyone in the room, uh, would, it would be wonderful if everybody participated in this conversation, is how we all owe it to ourselves uh, to do a little more digging, meaning what you see in the narrative that mainstream media puts out is a, such a small uh, portion of the picture to the point where I had a common, accepted that common narrative about people in Iran, about the people uh, behind the regime in, in Iran as well. I had mixed everybody into one. So basically the face of the last 40 years, 37 years is the Islamic Republic and I had just uh, fused the Islamic Republic with the people, with the general population at large, including the women of Iran, uh, who always appeared to be secluded behind the veil. And uh, in my uh, 10 years of PhD research, I found out how, uh, how erroneous that was. Not only erroneous, how these women in post-revolutionary Iran, despite all the discriminatory gender barriers, have accomplished so much and how they can serve as role models for so many women in oppressed societies. Uh, so I'm, what I'm, part of what I'm trying to do is uh, give these women a voice uh, and give them the recognition they deserve and also to shatter a lot of the narrative, particularly today with Iran being in the news for everyone knows the Iran deal, how the general population at large, 50% of which are women I advocate for daily, are part of the innocent citizens of Iran who've really suffered so much for over three decades through no fault of their own. So uh, every time I hear a piece of news, whether it's Iran related or not Iran related, I always think I have owed it to myself to do my own digging, meaning we sh all should uh, take uh, the time to do a little more research and not be affected overnight by what, by what we are told to believe or told is the reality of the situation. I know Steve and I communicate often uh, on social media and off of social media about motivational leadership, about uh, you know uh, leadership in a way that shatters a lot of the culture of fear climate that goes on. Uh, Yasmin is remarkable because she is what I call responsible journalism meaning she doesn't go with the, with the overall narrative. Uh, she actually, uh, she and I connected a long time ago over the fact that I noticed much of what she, all of what she reports is so accurate and also it counters the mainstream narrative specifically about Iran. So uh, this is why I'm a big fan of hers actually. So we wanted to, you know, have all of you join in a conversation about responsible journalism, responsible leadership, and also shattering a lot of what we're afraid of. Beautiful. Thank you. Let's give her a round of applause, yeah. first of all. Thank you. And, and I really mean that because, first of all, it is a huge privilege for me to be here. This is my city, and when Nina said that she wanted to bring a book tour here, I was like, yes. You get to come to the best city of all your tours, and all of you good people showed up. And um, and I actually have what I would call at least kind of an affinity. I mean, I was drawn to both of you in, in social media for a lot of reasons, but my son, or my daughter, married a young man that's half Persian, half Italian. So it was really interesting when I would see some of the, the tweets and some of the activity there. It was just kind of like this radar that directed me there. And then, uh, of course, when you invited me, my expertise is more around the level of leadership. But I can't think of a, a stronger leader, really, than Nina. And I even said yesterday, we were talking on the phone, I said, uh, I'm just excited to meet you in person because you're a great leader, you're very successful. And she stopped me and said, I'm not successful, or not that successful. And I said, well, first, let me define success. I believe success is when I get to live the values. You know, it's defining my values, and if I'm really living those values, I'm successful. It's not necessarily based on the symbols of success or what our culture says. And I said, you're also a spectacular leader for both of, both of you are 
for this reason. I would define leadership as if each of you, any of us, whether we have a position or not, if we positively influence people, right? If we show up and positively influence, you're probably a leader. If you have positive impact, every one of us is making a difference every day. The question is, what kind of difference are we making? And third, if we inspire greatness in others. And so um, I'll tell one brief story and give it back to Yasmin. I was on a flight. Uh, Nina had given me a signed copy of this book, and I hadn't yet got into it. I'd been busy on the road, and I'm like, she's coming to Seattle. I need to read this book. I mean, I've, I've got to at least get into this book. So I'm coming from Dallas to Seattle, and it's four hours. <clears throat> And I'm reading the book, and I really get into it. And, I, and, and I'm like, wow, this is really fascinating. I knew kind of portions of the tapestry of history, but portions of the revolution, but it was all like kind of coming back to me. And right next to me is a young woman reading a Us magazine. Nothing against Us magazines, OK? But she's reading an Us magazine, and I'm reading this nice, thick book. And the beverage cart service came, and they said, um, she turned to me, she said, I feel kind of silly because I'm reading the Us magazine and I'm trying to decide between these six ladies that wear gold dresses, which one looks the best in a gold dress. <laughs> and you're reading that really nice book. What is it? And I show her uh, the title, Jewels of Allah, the untold story, story of women in Iran. And her head tilted and she looked at me and she said, I know nothing about the women of Iran. And over the course of the next 10 minutes, I wasn't an expert, but I gave her layman's terms, and I basically gave her what you're going to receive tonight as a personal gift, which is that wonderful little book, which is the exemplary um, leaders of, of Iran, and some of which are world karate champion, world-renowned uh, classical guitarist, first female uh, um, orchestra conductor, award-winning journalist, first Iranian woman to serve as U.S. assistant to Secretary of State, and my personal favorite, um, the first woman to go into space and listen to this beautiful quote that she has, I hope to inspire everyone, especially young women and young girls, to not ever give up their dreams. Isn't that beautiful? And think about these young girls uh, all across uh, Iran today that are being oppressed and I, I really believe in, in, in what you're doing I really believe it's not just creating awareness but I think it inspires each of us to make a difference do you believe that? Mm -hmm. somebody not at me do you believe that? okay <laughs> thank you back to Yasmin oh, thank you and to your point that, um, that quote that you bring up by Anna Shansari so she's the first female um, Persian female um, lady to travel to space. Um, she, she also spoke recently at an event that I was at in San Francisco, and she is very inspiring. She reminds me a lot of Nina as well. Nina has inspired a huge, huge following, as many of you know, to, um, to, to really talk more about not just Iran and not just everything that the news and the media are covering right now, which is the deal and the nuclear you know, power and going to war and, and what is going to happen with the Iran deal. But there's so much more to the story. And it's, it's, it's so much more that there's an entire gender involved that's no, that no one's really speaking about. There is this, um, this movement that has that has been taking place and after ne reading Nina's book I found out I mean I'm, I'm Persian and I didn't know this that this movement started even before the Pahlavi era it was not just during the Pahlavi era so there's these you know there's so many years that have that have uh, that have gone by and that have you know um, it's, it's catapulted into this huge movement today that she writes so beautifully about in her book and I learned so much from reading it. So I think, to me, a leader is somebody who taps into something and is able to create a movement around it. And Nina has done just that in the States, you know, in, in Europe, um, even inside of Iran. She's talking about something um, such so big as, a, as an entire women's movement 
and she's bringing to the forefront all of these wonderful and amazing and accomplished women and you know all of the trials and tribul tribulations that they've had to encounter and endure and have really been able to become the success that they are today um, albeit they had you know everything working against them all the odds were against them and unlike some of the neighboring countries around Iran they they never have played victim to their circumstances they have never played a victim to the position that they're in they have completely taken their destiny into their own hand um, and it's just it's it, it's 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 beautiful it's a wonderful thing it makes me so proud to be an Iranian woman and Nina again has brought to my attention so many women who are who are so great and who are doing so many wonderful things. Thank you, Yasmin. I wanted to talk about Steve and the way he uh, inspires me some days when um, some of what I do is very hard for me when I'm specifically on social media and I communicate with so many beautiful young ladies in Iran uh, and, and, and their hardships. So there are, there are many days that I go to Steve's page, uh, in all honesty, because his, his leadership quotes resonate with me so you know on the surface it wouldn't seem like steve and i would have much in common just bio wise but i often go to steve's page because his uh, motivational inspirational and leadership a potpourri of stunning quotes that he puts on a daily <coughs> basis really resonate with me to the point where i retweet a lot of them hoping these young women will see these quotes and and you know sort of give them courage uh, to continue courage not to give up and 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 the way Steve literally uh, communicates with his followers if you if you haven't been on his page is stunning stunning so for me as an Iranian woman I would normally not think I had much in common with a motivational with a thought leader but uh, what I want to say is that a culture, you know, culturally we're more connected than we think we are. So uh, I'd like for all of us uh, specifically to think about what Steve does, which is peaceful, a peaceful dialogue, which is we don't uh, need to resort to name calling. We don't need to resort to um, using a language that's defamatory, that's derogatory to get the point across. Sometimes. Uh, I see. I can feel that Steve is referring to something that's uh, sort of could be referred. You can have a negative uh, output, but Steve takes a situation and puts a positive spin on it. So I can feel what he's talking about, but he does it in such a positive way that I've I've learned so much from him that you can say something and be referring to a negative situation, but uh, turn it around and make it positive and. I don't know how he does it, but it's remarkable because he does it every day. So, and if you haven't, he puts video snippets on his page too, which I listen to, and they, they, they really help heal. Um, and they nourish the soul and, and just show that how, uh, as human beings, uh, we can make a difference. So thank you for that, Steve. Wow, that's beautiful, thank you, that means a lot. Um, I, w I wanted to shift just for a second around the difference between uh, a person that kind of responds as a victim and, and being very fearful. Because if we, when I read about these women, I, I read about the overcoming and the different eras and the resiliency and all of that. They, they, have, they are today combating external forces, agreed? external forces that are very fearful. I mean, I can't even imagine it. You, you've studied it, you know about it. <clears throat> but in our Western culture, because I deal with leaders, and I, leaders from all different sectors and groups, we deal with a lot of internal fears in our culture. There's a lot of anxiety, there's a lot of internal inferiority, uh, lots of anxiousness, all of that. And one of the things that I'm always asked is, how do you shift from kind of being that victim to really be more resilient? And I would say, I know for a fact that you studied each one of these women, they had to overcome something, they had to overcome almost like this inner dialogue. How many of you know that there's a, there's kind of like an inner dialogue that goes on in your head every single day? Anybody, and it's not just you talking to yourself. I mean, it's like, there's what I call kind of a big voice and a small voice 
And it could be as simple as when you walk in and you, you rather than talking to somebody, you're like insecure, and, and that's your small voice talking to you, rather than your big voice saying, go over and meet that person. And I think that the, for me, when I talk to leaders, it, it has to do with being very intentional about how you start your day and what you put into your mind on a daily basis. So when you were saying, how do you do that or how do you put that positive stream out, I have to work very hard at it because the natural part of me wants to kind of do a short-term gratification, which is more on the negative side. So every morning I think, of a, I think in terms of a bucket and it's a physical, emotional, and spiritual bucket that I have to fill every single day. And before I ever get on social media, before I make any outside contact with anyone, I spend at least one hour working on me. And I'm the only person I know that does that. And I don't mean that in a prideful sense because I have 22 coaching clients and I talk to all of them because they're all giving out and each one of you are giving out every single day. But if you don't fill your bucket, and we fill it different ways, right? I, I encourage people to fill it three ways. Let there be some form of meditation, spirituality in the morning. Let there be some kind of thought, leadership, reading, personal development, and then do some thinking about how you're going to approach that day, the mindset that you want, the, the, the positivity, the spiritual. It's almost like you're programming, and in that one day, in that hour, it's called a holy hour, you fill the bucket. And then you're in a position to actually give. And I know for a fact when I was reading about these women, it's not just physical accomplishments in their lives, and even for Nina and Yasmin, it's not just the physical. They're doing internal work. They're doing, and each of you, I want to encourage you to do whatever it takes to fill your bucket. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. To fill your bucket with positivity, with, with a sense of soul, so many people today are treating themselves like machines, and the very first thing, they say that 80% of people immediately get on email. The moment they wake up, they grab their smartphone, and they're on email and social media right now. And other people are dictating their mood and their emotion and their anxiety levels before they even get out of bed. And so I'm not saying I don't check a few little things like make sure the world isn't falling apart or something like that. But I don't deep dive into any email. I go down and brew my coffee and it's like, I have one hour, just one hour, that I get to control and the rest of the day I'm gonna basically be triaging and you know, reprioritizing as the bullets come. And so, um, but that, these stories of overcoming and resiliency, and, and I always take application. I don't just look at something historically. I'm always saying, what do I learn from that? How does that woman speak to me? And um, so, what what is it? What would be a couple of fears that you guys have overcome? I'm just kind of curious because I think any vulnerability, uh, the revealing of feelings is the beginning of healing, not just for you, but for others. So the revealing of feelings is the beginning of true healing and wholeness. So what have you? What did you have to come overcome, Nina, to even do the book? It's a great question, Steve. You know. Um, for years after the Iranian Revolution, because it coincided with the U.S. hostage crisis, uh, I almost was fearful to tell people, I was 12, that I'm Iranian. It was almost shameful to be Iranian. So I uh, had uh, a way of sort of, uh, as a 12-year-old, and then Iran all of a sudden being in the news on Nightline every day, you know, day four hostage crisis, day 222, uh, this was ongoing and when you're 12 years old and you have to sort of uh, be apologetic about where you come from is a very difficult situation i know anyone who's iranian can relate to that right <laughs> yeah right so it's almost like how do you first of all communicate to anyone who's never met an iranian before that we're not all bad uh, so the, the, that fear I had this fear of every day meeting somebody that I had to sort of say, you shouldn't be scared of me, or that I had to apologize for being Iranian. So most of uh, what I have done really stems from that time of uh, not knowing much about uh, my, my own country of birth, unfortunately, because I left when I was 12. So I think part of my journey was 
to go back and rediscover the history of my country in depth so that I can I can be proud and like Yasmin said, I'm today proud to be an Iranian woman. Uh, I don't I'm not fearful to say I'm Iranian, even though this regime was the same regime that took the hostages in uh, 37 years ago. But I've evolved to the point where I want to relay that there's nothing, you know, again, we make so many assumptions based on fear and not knowing. I myself am guilty of that. So the other issue is I was talking to Yasmin and Steve. I was born into a non-religious Muslim family in Iran, although I had a grandmother who was devout and prayed every day. And uh, I always, myself, was a little bit fearful of religious people. Again, because of this regime being hardliners, uh, I sort of, in writing the book, I titled it Allah, Jewels of Allah, because today uh, Iran justifies the denigration of women and their inferior position and uh, sort of ordains it as the will of Allah, God, and the Muslim world. So I, uh, the title of the book is meant to pay homage to that which this regime denigrates. A leader, a, a leader to me doesn't you know, create followers, and that's exactly what these two people have done. They have created more leaders. Um, they, they have um, a huge following, both online and offline, and it's because they do lead by example. Um, for myself, coming out of college, I've always had, and up until just a few years ago, I've always had a mentor in my life. There's always been a significant person, whether it's a, um, you know, a, a colleague or a client of mine who's kind of been, become that person for me. And I think it's very important for women, um, particularly women who are wanting to assimilate into a new culture like we have done and many of you have done, and try to really be understood because sometimes when you're like in, you know, court, the corporate world, for instance, I knew nothing coming out of college what it was going to be like. I knew nothing about how to be and when I can speak, when I can't speak, when I can welcome myself to the table, when I absolutely need to be at a certain table and place myself at that table. Um, so it's, it, 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 for me, it was very helpful um, to have this other, you know, this person in my life that I can go to for that and to kind of, you know, really learn from. I've been able to learn absolutely very, very much of that just in the, um, the time that I've known Nina, um, when, when to, um, to have my voice heard, and that is always. You always have a voice, and that voice is, is always, it always needs to be heard um, at every table, and every discussion, and, and any, in any capacity, really. And I think um, through uh, Steve's feed and what Nina was mentioning is, um, his daily dose of inspiration. I think it's very important, and that's what the mentors in my life has really have really brought to my to my to my life is that that inspiration and that confidence in you know in ensuring that confidence within myself that it, it is there. Every time that I've notched a fear off of my list, I've become more resilient, more strong, more of the woman that I want to become. Um, so I think that, that that's, that's really helped me to overcome some of my fears, is having mentors, having that mentorship program and that support system. I mean, only 5% of women, um, you know, are, are um, only 5% of women are CEOs in the United States, 5, 5%, Fortune 500 um, companies. And it's it's a very small. We have so much work to, that needs to be I done. Never think that. No, and they're saying that it's going to take eighty-one entire years for this gender gap to be done away with. Eighty-one more years. Can you just imagine for a moment that we are in the United States of America, and another eighty years needs to go by before we are not earning seventy cents on the dollar. We are earning all and equal to men, and there is complete gender parity. So lots of work does need to be done, but for me, having that mentor in my life has really helped, um, and I have two great mentors sitting to, uh, right beside me here. So I'll give it back to you, thank you. Yeah, I come just to follow up on some of the statistics, it was interesting, 12% of women are at board level positions in America, only 12%. Uh, 52% of professional level jobs are held by women. 
52%. Only 5% are CEOs of uh, Fortune 500. 60% of undergraduate and graduate degrees are held by women. Um, and like you mentioned, 70 cents on the dollar. So like when I hear those statistics, I get upset because I, I have a daughter. And uh, though she's not in a course, she does some real estate, but, but it still affects her. And I remember her first entry level job, she was affected because there was another guy that was basically doing the same thing and she found out he was making more. And so, and I think for me, because of my platform, you say, well, what are some of the answers? I think you have to be a positive influence again. I think you have to create positive peer pressure. And for me, rather than accentuating the negative again, finding, Finding those that are doing it right and, and highlighting those, those companies, those leaders that recognize it or bring to attention. You've written some great articles. You've done some great uh, literary work on that to bring uh, it to my attention. Um, and, and just to shift for one thing, when you, when you looked at the, I want to mention again, the profiles of the women in the back. For me, that was, that was, the, that was a, the fun part of the read because it was very inspiring to me. And if anyone here in this room still wants to accomplish something, raise your hand. You still want to accomplish, I mean, something significant. You still want to do something. Come on, raise your hand. You still want to accomplish. That should be everybody's hand going up. We should all want to still accomplish something, right? And we all want to have fulfilling lives, don't you think? I mean, I want to find, it's not going to be a perfect balance, but I want to accomplish some things. I've got a couple books uh, that are right there as well. Uh, one that's going to be published in January. I, I want to accomplish some things, and I want to live in a fulfilled life. And people are asking me a lot, well, what, what, how do you go about that? And I always give them the three C's. And I didn't discover the three C's until I was out of work. Because typically you don't change when you see the light. You change when you feel the heat, right? When you go through brokenness. You lose a job. You go through the failing of a, of a marriage or a heartbreak of some sort. You tend to then get humble and you start looking inward, not just looking at the externals. And it was during four months of being unemployed that I came across the three C's. I can't even remember who gave it to me, but they said, until you discover what your true center is, you'll never find a great purpose. You'll never truly accomplish your purpose. You've got to find your center. You've got to know what your character is. Four or five values that are just locked in. Four or five values. And I would, I would challenge you to identify, document four or five values. Figure out what your center is. That moral compass or whatever it is that right in the center. I mean, strip it all away. You know, is it, is it, I actually asked the guy, what's your, what's your center? And he said, work ethic. And though I wouldn't, you know, that wouldn't be my center. I was like, okay, fine. But I think you need to know what it is. And you need to know those corners. And the final thing, and this is what Nina has done with this book and her cause, and when you read the introduction, it kind of wrapped it together for me because it says their cause has become my cause. And that is your contribution. And prior to those four months of being unemployed, my life was about the symbols of success being recognized, making money, getting a bigger house, um, having a certain position at, by age 40, and all of a sudden I realized, none of that's happening. Oh, no. And it, but it was the, the worst time of my life turned into the best time because it forced me to identify those three C's. And I said, if I could do it over again, I'd want leaders to go on a quest that I've been on in these last four months and I'd love to take leaders on a leadership quest. Yeah, that would be a really cool name for a company, Steve Gutzler and Leadership Quest. And the next day I registered it with the state of Washington, and that was in the late 90s, and I've been going ever since that point. It's not been up and to the right. It's more like a squiggly line, you know, three steps forward, two steps back. But once you know that, con for me, it's inspiring greatness in individuals and Organization. I, I love to inspire greatness in people and getting up in the morning. Yes? Uh, I thought when I came out there was something about the women of Iran and how they're living and what they're doing, but I'm not kind of getting that message. Did we get off message? If we got off message, that's I my fault. I, I haven't really learned anything. 
We're going to give it back to Nina so you learn something right now. Yeah, well, we should open it up to questions. Well, we, yeah, we can open it up, but the whole the premise of the discussion was the book, but also uh, to uh, talk about uh, how we can inspire positivity, inspire uh, greatness, inspire uh, leadership, motivation, and thought. Uh, so that was the premise of the discussion, uh, a part and parcel of which was highlighting the accomplishments of the women in Iran. So thank you. So we can open it up to questions? Yeah. That would be fabulous. I wonder what's, what happened to a one million uh, signature campaign that it was started. The grassroots movement. Yeah. The yes. one million signature campaign is uh, is ongoing, but what it, it doesn't get that much attention is because it's a grassroots movement, which is the only way a movement should be, in my opinion, meaning there are no leaders. It's made up from women from all walks of life. The One Million Signature Campaign has made strides. Uh, what I mean by strides is maybe nothing for us living in America today in the 21st century, but strides where women in Iran are concerned. A lot of the, uh, uh, what, what they were able to accomplish was partially reverse some of the discriminatory gender laws. They are continuing to advocate for those. One of the measures that they were, uh, they were received a lot of recognition for was women in post-revolutionary Iran are not allowed to serve as judges. Through their activism, they partially amended that, whereby women today are allowed to serve as what's called investigative judges. Now, this is a 50% uh, leeway, meaning it's not 100%. Another one of their accomplishments was uh, they were, uh, women were allowed to get, in Iran, women are not entitled to the same, what's called blood money. Uh, they were able to, uh, uh, women are entitled to the same blood money as men, but, but only in accidents that are covered by insurance. Don't ask. <laughs> but, but, you know, this is, uh, you know, you know, one step, you know, three steps forwards, two steps back scenario, but they are, their activism is ongoing. The reason, again, unfortunately, mainstream media does not, you know, they did highlight the one million signature campaign, but they don't follow up on these things. Do they so, have still? Do they have their site? Because I used to. Have well, you know what? What? It. Yeah, they have. They have. They had a site. What's yeah. difficult with Iran is, you know, that this regime tries to silence the women's rights movement. So if you even get five minutes of a of a site, you know, the, all the feminist uh, sites in Iran are shut down routinely. All the feminist magazines and posts from Iran. Uh, are shut down routinely, routinely for the slightest deviation. By the slightest deviation, I mean if you're advocating for equal rights, if you're advocating uh, to get uh, some of the gender discriminatory laws reversed, that's considered a violation. And you're, so if you have a five minute website up or your newspaper or magazine that's advocating for equality uh, runs the gamut for a couple of issues, it's, it's extraordinary in that country. So that's why, you know, those sites are routinely shut down, unfortunately. Right. Right. So, yeah, yeah. Good. So they're, they're threatened by feminist writers because it threatens their ideology? You know, the ideology is a hard line. You know, the church and state are, for lack of a better term, intertwined in post-revolutionary Iran. You have uh, the supreme leader who's a hard line uh, extremist, and part of that hard line ideology is that women are not equal to men. Women are considered inferior to men, and, you know, women are not allowed to serve as presidents uh, and defrauded in a number of uh, other venues uh, because they're simply considered, they're, you know, you're literally debilitated simply based on your gender from the day you're born, meaning they say that Allah, God in the Muslim world, considers women as inferior to men. So the premise and the foundation of all their just gender discriminatory laws stems from outdated uh, religious ideology, which, you know, these things may have, uh, you know, held in the seventh century, eighth century, tenth century, but it's almost like when you're a hardline extremist, you just don't evolve. Which is why I read the Pope's a quote uh, because it really uh, talks about how he says the traditional notion of God is outdated. So when you get hardline extremists that cling to the outdated notions of God and His ideology, so yes. Because two two women count as one. 
one man in the group. Yeah, so, exa thank you. Yeah, you know, for example, the testimony of a woman in Iran in court counts half that of a man's. So, uh, you know, meaning, you know, you don't have what, t what it takes. Uh, you, you're not, con you know, you're, don't, you're considered just by virtue of your gender inferior, meaning you don't have the same, uh, you're considered not uh, equipped enough to be able to pass a judgment. So it would take you and me versus one man to corroborate the same story. We're not whole. Exactly, we're not whole, exactly, yeah. So what is the education uh, outlook for women in the army? Women in Iran surpass men uh, by a ratio of approximately 66% of women. Uh, women dominate, which is uh, uh, very interesting that Steve brought this up. University Bookstore will be closing in 10 minutes. Please begin making your final selection. What's remarkable about what Steve brought up, which is approximately 60% of women in America uh, are in higher education uh, that dominate men. The same is going on in Iran, which is remarkable given the fact this is a patriarchal society. So women in Iran outnumber men by a ratio of 66%. Uh, so women excel in education. Women excel in all walks of life, which is what is extraordinary about this last 40 years, which is a patriarchal climate that has really engendered a full-blown feminist movement, which is a testament to the resilience and the courage of these women who remain undeterred despite um, this environment. I was wondering, how diverse is the Iranian feminist movement? Like, does it include various different ideological dispositions? Yes. Yeah, that's a great question. The feminist movement in Iran, uh, you know, Iran has never had, until post rev Iran, what's uh, by textbook definition considered a viable feminist movement. You had the Pahlavi monarchy, which bestowed many rights to women, but that's not a feminist movement because it's a movement, it's a women's rights itinerary that's dictated from above. So that is not, by textbook definition, a viable women's rights movement. Today, uh, we have a viable, and most vibrant feminist movement in the Middle East. Why? Because women from all walks of life, from all religious ideologies, are working together because they all have a common agenda. So you have all kinds of women from all different backgrounds, secular, religious, different religious ideologies, all working in sync uh, to make this hopefully one day a reality. I don't see it happening soon, but the important premise is resilience and not being deterred. Yeah, how does the Iranian women differ from the other surrounding countries, for example, like in Iraq? Or, I mean, how is it different in Iran for being a woman? You know, I'm, I, unfortunately, what I know about the periphery is not enough for me to be able to accurately comment. And you know, I would hate to comment because it goes back to my own uh, version of what I hear is again what I know is from mainstream media. I unfortunately have not done enough uh, research on my own to be able to accurately answer your question, and I tend to uh, stay away from commenting on things that I have only a very small version of because that leads to more misperceptions. So um, I could comment very on a very superficial way, but that wouldn't be fair to those women or those countries or even fair to your question. I apologize. What do you see when you go back to Iran? I don't, I can't go back to Iran. You don't go back to Iran? No, I don't okay. go, I can't go back to Iran. Okay, yeah, I do know other women who are going back to Iran, but you don't go back to Iran? No, okay. I hope to be able to. Okay. Any more questions? Okay, I oh, you have a question. Yeah, I was going to answer. Mm -hmm. question. I was there about year What I see there, women are really the most expensive clothes. They have the best body. They're drinking. They disco in the basement of the houses, and all kind of uh, expensive cars driven by 
twenty percent of people there. Um, That's what she said. Yeah, exactly. Now another thing I was going to interject. I hope you don't mind. You no. said you were apologizing for doing it wrong. I know. was in the beginning. No, yeah. no give me that. Mm -hmm. No, what I'm saying is saying there are three group of, group of people we're dealing with. They're ignorant. Mm -hmm. They don't know even the mayor of their town, the senator of That's their right. town. That's right. You can see that. Then the middle one that they're wondering, they're just watching you, the little box, mm -hmm. and all the information coming. And then we have another group like these people here. Mm -hmm. They want to find out. They, as Curious. Long as they know what they're doing mm -hmm. because there's nothing. We have the longest historical uh, history in the world from the Cyrus the, Cyrus the Great, and the women were on the top in every level yes. of the country. Yes. Even in the US, even Indian tribe, Indian tribe, sorry. Mm -hmm. The women were the top, mm -hmm. they have to talk to them, they have to dis make decisions through them. Mm -hmm. Now, the capitalist system, what they did, they pushed them to go to work in the farm, and they got married. You can see mm -hmm. some state, they can marry to mm -hmm. find mm -hmm. women, okay? Yes. And reality, we have a lot to be proud of it. First of all, we are human beings. Mm -hmm. Okay, mm -hmm. we have we have to have compassion for each other. Mm -hmm. Doesn't matter if you're Jewish or Muslim exactly. or black or white or something. Mm -hmm. We originated from one mm -hmm. creature, mm -hmm. whatever the creature mm -hmm. is, you can call it. But uh, <laughs> actually, I'm not. I'm American, Iranian. My Likewise. is coming from there, right? But uh, right. And I'm proud to be here. It's a great country. Same time, the history. Now, if something happened due to political movement, it's not mm -hmm. Iranian fault. Well, you know, right now, uh, what's going on is uh, social media has been extremely uh, helpful in uh, bringing exactly what you mentioned, which is Iran is a, a country of great cultural history, the Persian Empire. In many ways, Iran was more progressive in the fourth century because, as you mentioned, you know, the first charter of human rights thanks to Cyrus the Great. Uh, before pre-Islam, women were virtually on par with men. We had female commanders, women who ruled over the vast Persian Empire, queens, uh, female business owners, at a time where, you know, that that is part of Iran's history that has been forgotten, which shouldn't be forgotten. And so it's very important, and thank you for bringing this up, that we continue to highlight that forgotten narrative. So thank you for that. Thank you so much. I had a question. How does the Iran deal going to affect women in Iran? Or the, the peace? Like, is it going to help? It's going to yes. add more money to the economy, like a, a you know, million? That's a great question. The sanctions have not debilitated the regime, but they've had an extraordinarily negative impact on the general population at large. Uh, so the if the Iran deal goes through, uh, it's only a good thing for the general population at large. Specifically, you ask about the women. These women are highly educated. And what's going going on because of the sanctions, they're debilitated not only through the gender discriminatory laws, but also through the sanctions. So they have no economic prospects, bleak at best. And also at the same time, they're dealing with these laws that debilitate them. So you have a highly educated female population that these sanctions have proven to be a double-edged sword for them. So were this, uh, if this deal were to go through, it would be a tremendous relief to the general population at large, including the women, because so much of what you and I uh, take for granted and enjoy in this country, they don't have access to basic medical, uh, pharmaceutical, uh, you know, accoutrement, anything. Everything is, is just, uh, it, it's not a good situation. And uh, like I said, People don't realize that behind this regime are real people, are people who are suffering. So uh, hopefully uh, we can move towards uh, a resolution, which means this nuclear deal is not about supporting the regime, it's about supporting the people of Iran. I just wanted to bring everyone's attention to something that um, took place, started in Seattle years ago that I was involved with. It was a PBS it was eventually a PBS program, but Holly Morris um, was a journalist who lived in Seattle, and she decided to, um, she did programs for Discovery Channel, and she decided to go out and look for women who were not waiting for the ships to sail in, but were rowing out to meet them. 
And um, she picked five countries, and one of them was Iran. And she found out that I was living here through a friend. And so my mom and I helped her find some women to interview. And at first, we were both very skeptical, like you. Mm -hmm. Even though I had lived through the revolution, I stayed there till 83. And then I left, and my parents continued to live there. Mm -hmm. But even my mother wasn't sure how many people she could find. And she was blown away, mm -hmm. because this is about 15 or so years ago. Mm -hmm. so. It wasn't as easy to um, have a journalist come in and do any program about Iran. Mm -hmm. So she had to pretend to have a tea party and invite these women, pass the word around that if any women have accomplished anything big, to show up. And she was absolutely blown away by the women who showed up who um, owned trucking companies who had not inherited them, they had built them. Mm -hmm. um, a woman in a village somewhere outside of Shiraz who had a a uh, taxi company with women drivers. And, uh, so it was absolutely amazing, and the show was a hit. And it's called Adventure Divas. You can probably still at home. Adventure Divas. Thank you. And it's online, so you can probably get it. Thank you. Thank you so much. Yeah. It's a, is it a video or? Uh, she had. They had DVDs at the time uh, that they were selling, and it aired on PBS for a while. And can I ask you when this aired, roughly? I'm thinking um, it was probably about 15 years ago. Yeah. Thank you. That's very interesting. If you Google it, you'll find it. They still have their website, and you can still order it. We should look that up, yes. Yeah, yeah. Very yeah. That's very interesting. Yeah. Maybe yeah. we can do something for Women's History Month Absolutely. with this. Thank you so much. Yeah, and Holly's in New York now, I think. So That's just fascinating. Thank you. Thank you so much. I have one comment to make. Uh, what can we do that American or English speaking people can pronounce the name of Iran right? Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> I love you. Thank you. We were talking about that video. Yeah. yeah, so maybe Steve can answer. That. Maybe Steve. Well, Steve is telling me. Yeah, right. So well, Steve so has an Iranian uh, son in law, so. <laughs> Bernie Sanders called it Iran. I know. Oh, I know. And, and you would think Iran being in the news for 37 years. That, that and, uh, and knowing that Italy is the same, you say <laughs> Italy. That's right. That's Maybe right. you can help. <laughs> we'll work on that. I want to just say this. I, I hope everybody knows that the proceeds of this book, do you know that it goes to charity? which I think is fabulous. Could you tell a little bit about that? Um, the majority of the, pro the, all the proceeds are going to various charities with the majority going to the Omi de Mer Foundation, which is a 501c3 uh, charity that's been uh, helping disadvantaged young women in Iran for over 10 years. NBC uh, recently did a, few, a five minute video documentary with that they'd gone to Iran and spoken to these women in these shelters. Uh, you should check it out. I, I posted it on my Facebook and Twitter page. It's a remarkable story, and and they they are really they are amazing. They are volunteers, and they are really really impactful. So uh, every 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 dime counts, really. Thank you, Steve, for bringing that up. I appreciate it. So um, my my question is about the curious as to what's your end message in mind, what's, what's the goal of this meeting today, what are you expecting us to get out of it, mm -hmm. and really, um, what is what do you think is going to make the ultimate change, what's going to make the psychology of the Iranian regime mm -hmm. change in such a way that we can live the life that now the Catholic religion has evolved to the extent that they can say you can be non-religious so what do you think is the right well first of all the overall message of this book is again uh, to what I refer to as a global sisterhood which global sisterhood is powerful so every one of us has an obligation to give and lend a voice to those that are debilitated uh, in oppressed societies the other message is that uh, you mentioned, you bring up the Pope, and I thank you. I've devoted a chapter to what, again, I did not know about, which is within this banner of this regime are progressive individuals, reformists, that have actually, they're men who are clerics, 
who are like the Pope, progressive minded, who have actually helped religious women's rights activists reinterpret passages in the Quran that have been used to justify the inferior position of women, uh, to show that the Quran is fluid, that it has the ability to evolve and adapt to the needs of a 21st century society. Of course, the hardliners have branded this ideological leap of faith as blasphemous as we would expect. But the best case scenario for Iran is for, uh, they had for eight years President Khatami, which is the reformist, uh, which is when the feminist movement actually uh, came into full force because Khatami and his constituents allowed, gave licenses for a lot of these feminist publications to uh, come into the, into the mainstream, so to speak. But again, you have to realize the uh, president, no matter how reformist or progressive he is, he is severely handicapped by the supreme leader. So the best case scenario is that there, the good news is there are progressive people in Iran under this banner. Uh, the bad news is we have a, a hardline supreme leader. The best case scenario would be for the person who replaces the supreme leader to be a progressive individual, like the Pope himself, someone like that. So change can come from within. Uh, and that would be a, more of a peaceful solution. Uh, what I don't want for my country, because I witnessed it firsthand as another revolution. Revolution is nothing but bloodshed and egregious loss of lives. So I, what I hope for is that because there are such individuals under this regime, that one of those will hopefully uh, take the position of supreme leader and be able to make a little bit of a difference. Thank you. Thank you so much for such a phenomenal job for all three of you. I just want to make two comments. One was to your question about how this will affect the country. I just want to make a comment that history has shown when countries are isolated, like let's say Cuba or North Korea, the dictators actually become more powerful. The hardliners become more powerful. But when you open up to the country, you give the, the people the tools that they need to actually, through evolution, make the change. So that's what we hope the deal goes through. For one, we don't want another third war on our credit card here, another six trillion dollars, and then some people killed on both sides and get nowhere like we got in other places. And secondly, by opening up the doors, you actually give the people the tools to, to help make the change. The second comment I wanted to make is based on what you said, that the interpretation is based on these fanatical clerics. It's not what's written, it's what their interpretation is. Because, because there's many passages about protection, equal rights, rights to divorce when it didn't even exist in the West, rights for inheritance, rights for being taken care of in case of a divorce, and so forth and so on. It's because of the interpretation of the fanatics, and I think all fanatics who come from the same traveler, is their crazy interpretation that then creates that inferiority or tries to for force that inferiority. There's others that interpret it in a very different way. So it's not what's written, it's how they, they the fanatics interpret it, and just all out of control. Thank you so much. Thank you, thank you so much. I think to answer my friend's question here, I think what I take away from this is that all of us here have heard things that maybe we did know, and maybe we just need to get some more facts out of this book so we can say there was this woman who did this and that. I think each one of us, um, taking from our other friend who toured with you for a while, we each have to become an ambassador, even if there isn't um, a political dialogue going on. Uh, that we can each be mini ambassadors and spread the word and let people know what Iran is really like and why um, they should care and uh, what they can do. You know, I think I think once people get to know each other, they're not so quick to harm each other. Mm -hmm. That's great. a great point. Thank you. Uh, I want to bring up the question of the you know, we, we keep saying it's not just for Iranian women. We keep saying that the success is usually the CEOs or, you know, mostly about um, wealth mm -hmm. or writers or some people who are shining in their careers. I think um, it's time for women to also show, come up in spirituality as well. Mm -hmm. And every woman, most of us are mothers and we bring love and forgiveness and understanding to this world. And I was reading this book called um, 13 Grandmothers. I don't know if you with anybody read that book. It's about 13 grandmothers throughout the North and South America and how they are going to save 
the way we are treating the planet is because they're groundwonders, mm -hmm. because they care more for the planet Earth. And I realize that as a woman, we have so much power, not just in political or um, businesses or money, education. We just by being women and mothering, mm -hmm. we can really create a lot of um, connection. So I think it's time for also to shine a light on women who are leaders in their families or neighborhoods or society. And they may not get names published here and there, but I know for sure my life, uh, my mother, who doesn't have any title, has been a very good role model for me with her little tiny loving things she does every day. It's a great message. And I wanted to say that my I agree with you about not having a title or a name. The two women, and I talk about this in my introduction, uh, that inspired me and didn't have a title or a name were both my grandmothers, one on my paternal side and one on my maternal side. One was a secular woman, one was a religious woman. And I uh, took at face value how strong they were and how much I took away from them. And I only realized later in life how they had inspired me because I was close to both of them. And like you so beautifully said, you don't need a title. Thank you. Yeah. It's a wrap.